everyone. It is Mark Sabatella from Mastering Muse Score, and welcome to the Music Masterclass. So this is my Thursday series where we talk about making music. We talk about composing, improvising, uh, playing by ear, arranging, all sorts of things that relate to the kind of creative act of creating music. So that's what we're going to be dealing with here today, and um, I'm looking forward to just uh, talking about music and listening to it and and learning what we can about it. I'm going to tell you, you know, some mornings I tell you, oh, I'm having technical issues today, blah, blah, blah. Well, no technical issues today, but, you know, it's been one of those mornings of just dealing with stuff, you know, the cable TV at home and, you know, bank account stuff and just, you know, stuff to deal with. And it's just, I'm, I'm ready to kind of clear my mind from that and just have a nice relaxing session of dealing with music. So that's, um, <laughs> that's what I got to tell you today. So I'm just, uh, interested in, in being chill here. So, uh, I, I don't have, like a really specific agenda today. I mean, I, I typically don't necessarily for masterclass, but we are going to like listen to some music and make some observations. And I always do like to start by following up on, you know, things that have come up either in the things that I brought up myself, like through the newsletter or things that have come up in the community. And so I want to do that a little bit here. And um, one of the things I want to follow up on, actually, there's several things I want to follow up on here. And um, one of them is a little bit about some of the, the discussion uh, from the Braille study group. And I'll post about this, but since it's fresh on my mind, I might as well just say some things out loud here. Um, I did just post this uh, thing in the accessibility space yesterday, uh, making some observations about like how to learn to recognize all these crazy patterns of dots and what they all are. And um, uh, I did see the correction from Jeannie, and thank you very much about the W. Uh, the W is like its own special world, and I acknowledge that. But then I, but but then I got the detail wrong about it. So yes, it is dot six, not dot three and six, that are there on the W. So. Great. And also an interesting thing about the Braille alphabet that is, you know, could be uh, interesting to anyone. Um, there really is kind of a pattern to how those dots all work for the alphabet. It's not an obvious pattern, but it is a deliberate pattern. And uh, I did pay, I, I pointed it out in, in the post. And it was interesting to me that two different people commented essentially the same thing. Oh yeah, I'm aware of that pattern, but I didn't learn it that way which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's a very specific pattern. The patterns that are used for the letters A through J then get recycled for the letters uh, K through T and then recycled again for the letters U through Z, but with the addition of some dots on the bottom. And so that is, was very deliberate. And I remember having learned that many years ago. Uh, I don't even know why I learned it, but I just did. But then I couldn't remember it. And even staring at charts of full of the Braille alphabet, I couldn't discern the pattern. I had to be... I had to actually look it up thinking, I know there's a pattern here. I know there's something to how this all works and I can't see it. Um, and I had to look it up and find it because most of the instructional material doesn't actually point out that pattern. They just give you some things to memorize. So that's um, just sort of uh, um, just a, a, an interesting thing about Braille that the alphabet has a pattern, but it's not like, it's not necessarily how people go about learning it normally. I also made an, make an observation about vowels, uh, and I'll, I'll point that out later, but they have a particular thing going on about uh, being a diagonal across the top. Anyhow, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking about Braille at this point because we're here to talk about music also. Um, so that's one thing. Here's the other thing I want to follow up on. Um, in the cafe yesterday, I was looking at uh, my arrangement of hot cross buns. And um, I've played a little bits of this before. Um, I wanna play through it again now, and we're just gonna talk about some of the stuff going on here and maybe use that to frame other discussions that we're gonna have today or at any time. So, um, what this is, is an, ar an arrangement for people who missed my discussion of it yesterday. It's an arrangement for two recorders, soprano recorder just playing the really simple basic uh, 
song as learned by American school children uh, throughout the country. It's a really silly, simple melody. It's a simpler melody than the original uh, British folk song that this was based on. It's a simplified version of that. So it's as, it's as simple a melody as possible. So the soprano recorder part is just that melody over and over again. My alto recorder uh, part, I wrote to be an accompaniment to it, and I wanted it to produce um, different accompaniments. And so I just ended up gluing them all together. So I have this arrangement basically consists of the melody eight times with increasingly um, complex accompaniment. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how that accompaniment is structured. And so that we can talk about some of the particular things that go on. And then as we look at other music, we can we can look at it through that lens. All right. So first, let me just play you the whole thing. It's not that long. Here's the melody. Here it is with the simplest accompaniment. Now, slightly more complex. A little more complex coming up. More complex. Minor. Now an ornamented version. And now kind of the finale. All right. So I actually wrote a whole zillion of these little variations for this accompaniment. And these were kind of the eight that I settled upon um, to make up my arrangement. Um, but what I want to talk about here is intervals. And so this harkens back to some of the things we discussed during the basic music theory cohort. And I want to talk about the intervals in terms of uh, mul the, the harmonic intervals, the, 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 the distance between the soprano and the alto part, what's actually going on between them. Um, yes, the top melody didn't change. It was the same basic third grade uh, re recorder melody all the way through. It's just the accompaniment got more and more complex. So I want to talk about the interval between the soprano and the alto part and the idea of consonance and dissonance, which is something, again, we, we dealt with in talking about the basic music theory course. And we'll deal more in uh, with respect to the harmony course. And then when I eventually do a whole cohort version of the, of the counterpoint course, we'll, we'll be revisiting these things. But I, I want to point out all the different ways these, these come into play. So the first thing to know about this uh, recorder melody is it sounds an octave higher than written. Yes, it's written as the B on the middle of the staff, but it's actually sounding like a B an octave above that, right? It's written as B4, but it sounds like B5. And as uh, Bob Long just um, confirmed in published recorder music uh, it, in Braille, it, it works the same way. You write that note as B4 and, and just people know to play it uh, with the fingering that actually produces a B5 on the soprano recorder. So this note is actually an octave higher than it looks like. So that's a B5. The harmony note against it is a D. Five. So this interval between the two notes is a sixth. And if I go and play basically what I wrote, uh, I can play that one with one hand. The rest of it I'll need my other hand for. It was sixths all the way, right? Sixth, sixth, sixth. Sixth, 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 
sixth, sixth. The distance between those voices remained a sixth at all times. And this is one of the things that I have observed is a really good uh, rule of thumb as far as how you can often get good results in creating a harmony line is to put it either a third or a sixth away from the melody. Depending on the style and what you're trying to do, it might be a lower harmony like it is here. The harmony note is below the melody because that melody is that in that upper octave. In some styles of music, in some types of instrumentation, you might be putting that harmony line above the melody. That's something you have to treat a little more carefully if you want to put harmony above melody. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it, it is something that you 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 have to think about how you're going to uh how you're going to achieve the right balance in doing that and uh whether or not it's the right sound for the genre so in this case it's the sixth below the other thing that often works is a third below and i can do that if i go now it's a third below but what's happening when i do that when i do this it sounds major when i do this it sounds minor, would you agree? Well, why is that? Well, first of all, you know, if you don't agree, um, that, that's fine too. It, it's, you know, it's hard to say when we only hear two notes without a whole full accompaniment what's going on. But when we hear two notes at a time, that could be either major or minor. But when we hear the whole thing, it kind of adds up to an E minor triad overall, if I were to play it that way. And so, Sometimes the way you pick between the third and the sixth uh, below the melody is which is going to give you the right chord. So when I play this, that half note, E and G, as Colleen is saying, is a minor third. And with the B that we heard at the beginning of the measure, this all adds up to an E minor triad. When I play this, this interval here happens to be a minor sixth, but really... If I think about the beginning of the measure, the B and the D, and then the long note in the measure, the, the B and the G, it all adds up to a G major triad. So the odd man out is always what's on beat two, but that's the weaker beat. So this feels like a G chord, and then probably a D7 chord, right? If you look at that A and the C, our brain might fill in a little one, five, one. One, one, five, one, one, five, one is what our brain naturally wants to fill in there. Our brain wants to kind of hear one chords and five chords where it can. So this kind of confirms the, uh, the majorness of things, where if I play this, it feels more like this. One, five, one in E minor. So um, assuming I want it to sound like major, then um, I kind of want, uh, I, I want this version with the sixth. And yes, I could certainly add a third note in there. Ooh, I like, I like your line there. But when I do this, it starts off major and ends more clearly minor. So this is the sort of thing I don't do in this arrangement until I do, right? That's why I made a point of saying later on, I have a more minor version of it. So at the beginning, when I'm trying to keep things simple, I want it to be simple and major because that's normally how we perceive of this piece. So the fact that I'm using a sixth below the melody instead of a third isn't inherently, oh, sixths always make things major and thirds always make things minor. It has to do with what the melody notes actually are. It has to do with looking at the overall triad that's being formed between the key notes of what you're doing here. And so uh, as we go through the piece, if I go into the next little section here, we see this. So we have a sixth between the B and the D and then a third between the F sharp and the A, and then unison. And then it's just like a little one, five, one. And now again, a sixth and a third and a unison with the accompaniment going one, five, one. And now this is a sixth. This is a fourth here. And I'll come back to that a second. Then another sixth, and then a fourth, and then another sixth, third, 
unison. So again, it's primarily sixths, but with some thirds in there, right? We have sixth third, sixth third. So we've got some thirds in there. We do have that fourth between the D and the G. And this is the interval that I describe as being a little bit special. Is it a uh, consonant or dissonant and it sort of depends on context and even in the most dissonant context we're still going to accept that it's not as dissonant as seconds or sevenths can be or tritones for that matter and we're going to have a tritone uh, at some point in this piece um, so the situation in which that this fourth is considered dissonant is kind of this one where the bottom note is actually where the dissonance, that fourth, is against the lower note. So if you've got a two-voice texture, we typically try to, uh, we treat those fourths as dissonance. That doesn't mean we don't use it. You know, dissonances are cool in the right context, and I'll show you how this is the right context. But when there's only two voices, fourths are considered dissonant. If there's lots of voices, then we don't care that there's a fourth somewhere in there. That's gonna happen every time you play a triad, and repeat the root on top, you're gonna to have a fourth in there, right? So it's not like fourths are inherently bad things, but fourths above the bass note. This fourth here, again, not dissonant in the sense of being really unpleasant to listen to, but it's a little unstable and it kind of wants to do that thing. This kind of wants to go here and then go there. There's sort of a tendency of that fourth. So fourths, the dissonance of a fourth isn't like, oh, therefore we avoid it. It's that we treat it in a particularly careful way. And one thing that that means is we resolve dissonances by step most of the time. And that's what I do here. Here's a sixth between the voices and then a fourth between the voices. But this fourth gets resolved to a consonant. It's a fourth here and then the next beat. So that's right here. Here, that fourth resolves to a sixth, and the bottom the bottom voice went D to C sharp, so it moved by step, as did the top voice. And then again here, we have a fourth that resolves by step, top voice going up, bottom voice going down. So, um, you know, the actual treatment of the intervals in here, when things are really simple like that, you really need to be paying a lot of attention to those sorts of details. Now, if I then jump ahead uh, to this little section here, That's the part where this is very much like the bass line Colleen that you kind of wanted here. You talked about you talked about G, F sharp, E. I'm not doing exactly that, but I sort of am, right? Here's G, F sharp, E. So I do have uh, basically in this measure right here. So I do get to hear that G, F sharp, E descending line here, but I also have the rest of the triad or, you know, parts of the rest of the triad being filled in. So instead of just being playing quarter notes here, I'm playing so that I get to hear the entire G triad and then, which is a D sharp diminished chord. And that's that leading tone there, that D sharp helps that much more in preparing the ear to accept this E minor chord. Because I haven't gone minor in this piece yet. Not, not in that sense, not going to E minor on that melody. So this is the spot where I introduce it. So this idea that we're gradually increasing the complexity, not just in terms of how hard, because obviously this is eighth notes and I started off with quarter notes and half notes. So it's fingering wise more complicated, but it's also harmonically more complicated as I'm moving along. So I basically have this, but I also have if I follow the so it's like I have and also have it's like I have all of those things happening. 
at the same time, and I'm splitting them in between octaves to make it easier to follow it. So this is like what is called a compound melody. When you have these eighth note lines that are doing this sort of thing, don't think of it as leaping up a fourth and down a fifth and up a tritone. Don't think of it that way. Think of it as two separate lines. This line is ba dum bum, right? It's bum, bum, um, if I just look at the off beats. And the top line is one. Oh, no, those are the notes on the beat, right? D and C are on the beat, and the B there is off the beat. But the top part of the line is bum, bum, bum. So just listen to that measure again. Whoops, listen to that measure again in both voices. So I get to hear both bum, 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 bum. I get to hear G, F sharp, G, and... D, C, B. I get to hear both those lines together, but then the next measure is the one where it, instead of going D, C, B, goes D, D, sharp, B, and therefore, in co combination with the top voice, going G, F, sharp, E, it gives me the sense of a G triad, and then a D sharp diminished triad, and then an E minor triad. So it's basically modulating or at least temporarily transitioning to the relative minor. So all the things that I'm talking about, I'm not, I'm not saying these things to say, oh, look at this thing I invented. No, I didn't invent any of this stuff. This is classic treatment of intervals, voice leading, and harmony. And uh, again, it's, it's a good lens to look at really any music we wanna look at through these types of lenses. And so now that I've established the possibility of E minor. I only hint at it there. Whoops, let me uh, play the both staves. There's the E minor. Now, I'm not, I'm back, back to G. Back to G major, but then, now I embrace the E minor. Right, that's all very E minor. And now it's basically one, five, one in E minor that I'm indicating through my line. And again, it's this thing, did I use the term compound line? I don't remember if I did, but that's the, that is the word for this thing when you have this jumpy stuff going on. Don't think of it as E jumping up a fifth, jumping down a sixth, jumping up a sixth, jumping down a fifth. It's not. It's <clears throat> like two separate lines. One going E, D sharp, E, E, D sharp, E on the B, and mm, bum, mm, bum, rest. Um. So one voice is going bum, 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 and the other voice is going rest, B, rest, B, rest, B, rest, B. B, B. So it's like two separate voices, logically speaking, combined onto one line there. And that is, is a hallmark of how we write for instruments in particular, you, you, uh, and especially when we're trying to make a lot happen with a uh, few notes. Like if you're trying to write a simple piano piece, um, where maybe only one finger is needed at a time in each hand or only a couple fingers, this is how you do it. Or if you're trying to write a piece for two recorders, um, again, you let you can get the sound of a three note chord by letting one of them do this compound line thing. It's a really powerful technique. It's also how Bach manages to write. <laughs> We, we spent a long time talking about that piece a few months ago, the uh, um, cello suite G major, like, you know, the famous one. Um, uh, they're all kind of famous, but that's by far the most famous. It's a triad then, a triad, and but don't think of it as like he's leaping all over the place. It's bum, bum, and then there's a middle voice going bum, 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 bum. I said the bottom voice is just hanging on the G. The middle voice is going D, E, and the top voice is going B, 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 
C B C C B C. It's all smooth within each voice, but it's three voices all compounded into one line. So this way of organizing things is it's been around, you know, like this is very, I mean, I was definitely trying to channel Bach a little bit in writing this, no, no doubt. Also, part of me was trying to channel Mozart, thinking about the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star variations, which frankly, I don't really know. I mean, I've heard them, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really super familiar with that piece. Um, so anyhow, uh, yeah, those are things to know. And here again, like if I want to talk about intervals, this is something I don't normally do much of. It's just an open fifth. B in the top, E in the bottom. I usually like to get the third of the chord involved, but it just wasn't going to work from a uh, um, voice leading perspective to try to get the G in there. I really wanted that B on top. I wanted that sound. I could have made but that's now it's jumpy. This is in, is somehow less jumpy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let me say that again. This is in some ways less jumpy than this. Ah. Because boo da boo bum is now angular, right? It's like going up and down in different ways. It's harder to sort out what's going on. This is actually less jumpy because I keep coming back to that same note. And it actually makes it physically easier to play on recorder because I just know I can keep coming back up to that same thing. I can play that line pretty well. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so it, I left out the G uh, because it gave me the better voice leading that I want. But I usually wouldn't want to focus too much on this type of sound, this open fifth without the third in there. But I knew I was going to get thirds in there soon enough because the next thing I have is, sorry, um, I'm trying to play this A and that D sharp together. This is a tritone, and tritones are dissonant, and they should resolve by step, and they do. That A comes down to G, that D sharp goes up to E. Again, the B, it's like another voice. Don't even think of it as related to the D sharp. It's like two separate parts, one voice going bum, bum, and the other one going bum, bum, bum. So um, this is all kind of a good microcosm of good basic a, a technique for how we can spin our intervals and chord knowledge to create lines that actually work musically. All right. So, um, yeah, those are some of my observations on this piece that, uh, you know, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on harmonically that we can come back to uh, some other time. But I'll, I'll, I'll just point out things like this little passage here. Harmonically, it's G, and then it's like a G7 with the seventh in the bass, going to going to kind of a C major chord. So it's like G to G7 to C, one, one dominant seventh to four, but using an inversion to connect things smoother, smoothly. Then it goes to what would be the minor four chord, but I've actually used that minor four chord a couple other times in this piece. So here I'm cranking up the intensity that much more by going to this sound. So, uh, mm, this sound here is related to the minor four sound. This sound would have been a C minor. This sound is an augmented sixth chord. And I talked about an augmented sixth chord a little bit. Uh, and I talked about it last week. Did it come up in Elsa? Now I can't remember where it came up. Um, but sometime in the last couple of weeks, I definitely was talking about augmented sixth chords. Um, yeah, I think it was in Elsa. Um, so that sound, in this case, this is what would be called a uh, um, Italian augmented sixth chord. It's only got the three pitches, G, E flat, and C sharp. And then it resolves to a one chord in second inversion, 
which is a typical way it might it might resolve. So harmonically, I've got minor four chords, I've got augmented six chords, I've got all, I've got that diminished chord, I've got that modulation to the relative minor, I've got all the harmonic things that we expect to have going on um, in pieces written, you know, since the Baroque, basically. Um, but I start off thinking more purely about intervals with only implications of harmony, and now I'm getting a lot more specific about harmony. Um, and yet that C sharp comes out from voice leading reasons, because check out this middle, check out that line um, that's formed at the, the middle of this chord. Again, I'm switching octaves just to, to make it really clear, but I can do it here. So what we have is two different lines going on in the left hand. We have bum, ba -dum, ba -dum. and the top voice is bum, bum, bum. So we have that voice leading is the derivation of that augmented sixth chord. That's where it comes from. It came from voice leading considerations and then eventually becomes part of our harmonic vocabulary, but it comes about from thinking about voice leading. So all of these things all interrelate to make, uh, to make this piece um, kind of what it is. Um, that sound, that augmented sixth chord sound, notice where it is. It's on that half note in the second bar of the phrase. In my final melody, I bring in that sound again, but not, not here, instead, here, there. So now I have that exact same sound, but it happens a bar later, and the melody note is A. This makes it what's called a French augmented sixth chord, which is that much more dissonant. The original chord here, I'll play it in this octave, had uh, the dissonance between the E flat and the D flat and the D flat and the G, or C sharp, I should call it. Um, that's the augmented sixth, E flat to C sharp. But by also having an A in there, I still have that dissonance, still have that dissonance, but now I also have this dissonance and that dissonance, right? So this so-called French augmented sixth chord is that much more dissonant but it still wants to resolve that exact same way to the one chord um, in second inversion or perhaps to a five chord. So this is all, again, stuff we go into way more detail about and really study and apply in the harmony course. So I'm still kind of, um, you know, preparing you uh, for thinking along those lines. Um, so yeah, this is what I mean about not only increasing the melodic complexity of this. Yeah, obviously these are 16th notes. It's harder to play this passage. This is the passage I've worked the hardest on. This passage here, the one with the, the little trills, is harder to play than it has any right to be. I don't know why it is. Maybe it's just that I don't practice it enough. That shouldn't be hard, but somehow it actually is to me. And I, yeah, it may be just those little trills, uh, you know, or mordants uh, mess me up a little bit. But so, but then that final one um, is the one with all the 16th and the, that harmonic complexity of that augmented sixth chord, which is the most harmonically complex chord uh, that I've got going here. The only, the only one that anyone would say is more harmonically complex is this chord called the Tristan chord, which is a Wagner thing. Uh, you know, just continuing on the, uh, discussion of Wagner from last week, uh, there was this particular chord, uh, Tristan and, uh, und Isolde. Um, I don't, I think I'm pronouncing that pretty well, but uh, anyhow, it's a very particular chord that I, I never remember the details of, but it's like, Ooh. And after that, it's, people stop thinking about complexity of chords. They're like, yeah, we're just going to make music be atonal if we want it to be atonal. Um, but yeah, so this augmented sixth chord is already like, that's about as harmonically complex of a sound as, uh, as the standard harmonic vocabulary has. And so this piece gets progressively more complex rhythmically, technically, and harmonically as we go along. And that's not necessarily always like I did that because this is kind of a theme and variations type of approach here. Um, so I'm not saying that most pieces will progressively get more complex like that, but control of the complexity is what you want. Be complex where you want to be complex. Be simple where you want to be simple. It's not always going to be just one big complexity crescendo like this is, but you know, those are, those are the ingredients that you have to play with. 
All right. So all of that said, what I'm going to do here is flip over to the community. And, you know, I said I wanted to, like, listen to uh, some people's music that have been posted here. And so I'm just going to grab a sampling of some things and uh, talk a little bit with this uh, here. So this, this is what I haven't even listened to yet uh, from Jim Ivey, who is he's brilliant. Uh, Jim, Jim does great stuff. Um, so uh, we're just going to listen to things. And I'm going to totally trust that this can be as brilliant as everything else I've heard from Jim. And, you know, I'm not going to dissect every last aspect of it, but I'm going to look, just talk about it briefly through the lens of what we've just been talking about. So let's hear. Okay, first of all, I love it. Not what I was expecting um, at all. Um, so, but let's talk about what it is and what made it so unexpected. So I was expecting it to sound like a medley with recognizable snippets of melodies and so forth, because again, I haven't seen it yet. He posted it yesterday, but I was involved with other things. So um, if we actually look at comments here, uh, okay, talking about, um, I detected a short fragment of Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, okay, so begins with a mo motif similar to Rudolph with more imagination. You find jingle bells, etc. So yeah, you, he, Jim is admitting that you basically need um, uh, <laughs> uh, to use imagination. And I imagine somewhat tongue in cheek cheek here, but maybe, Jim, if you're here, you can uh, uh, let me know. As the subtitle proclaims, I carefully researched over 2,000 years of music um, and included at least one note of every Christmas tune ever written. Um, so <laughs> some of the very same notes used by Beethoven. Is like, this is the, so this is very... Uh, oh, and Wagner. God, oh, glad. Great. <laughs> so this is... Um, very tongue-in-cheek and dense the entire musical output of Western civilization into 32 measures. So um, this is um, very, um, very amusing. All right. So uh, so I, I say it's amusing because what he's, he's being sarcastic here. Right? He obviously didn't carefully research 2,000 years of Christmas music. And if you did take one note from every piece, is it going to be recognizable? Well, no, of course. You can't recognize a piece by a single note. Okay, every once in a while, maybe you could. Um, think about, we talked about the Rite of Spring uh, a few months back as we worked on transcribing, you know, entering that bassoon solo into Muse Core. Ba -da -da -da, like that bassoon opening solo. When you hear ba on the bassoon, but in the proper octave, because it's an octave higher than that, um, played in that way, on that instrument, in that octave, out of context, I think you could hear that one bassoon high C, and it would be hard to hear that and not think of Rite of Spring if you're at all familiar with that piece. So there's some other things kind of like that, where if you know a particular piece that really focuses on a particular instrument and a particular note where you could really identify the piece from that one note. But in general, no. Could you identify a piece from two notes? Well, maybe. How about this one? What melodies can you think of that start off that way? Well, I got two of them for you. Somewhere over the rainbow and chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Right? So that would have been more likely here. So any place where there's an octave, Jim could 
say, hey, I took that from a Christmas song, right? But there's a million other songs that have octaves in it. So in order to have recognizable snippets of melody, you generally need more than one or two notes. Once you get to three, it starts to become maybe or Bali high maybe. Oh, okay, now it's chestnuts. Ah, now it's definitely chest chestnuts, because somewhere over the ray is a slightly different melody after those first three notes. So once you get to more than three notes, you start really narrowing down what the song is. So um, Jim is not doing that here. <laughs> he is not putting in long enough pieces of a melody to actually be recognizable. Um, but let's talk about some of what is happening here. That opening passage here, before I recognized that this whole piece was going to be that uh, tongue-in-cheek aspect, we have... Oops, let me play it in the right octave. And what's going on there? Those same parallel six that I used in Hot Cross Bun. So he's got this simple texture to start off with ju just parallel sixths, right? And then when he comes up here, it's parallel thirds, right? And then finally coming up to an octave there. So parallel thirds plus an octave, right? Tenths, technically speaking. From D up to F, C up to E, right? These are parallel tenths, which you might as well just call parallel thirds. So he's absolutely using that idea that when you want that simplicity, go with just a couple voices and use parallel motion. And not just parallel motion, but also think about my piece. One thing I didn't observe about my piece was at the beginning, the rhythms are identical. Quarter, quarter, half. Quarter, quarter, half. Meaning identical between the voices. Both voices have the same rhythm. Quarter, quarter, half. Quarter, quarter, half. But then I already deviate that from, from that ever so slightly by saying, I decided not to go. Because I thought it'd be actually a little more interesting to have half notes against those eighth notes. So I start off as simple as possible, identical rhythms, and then go into what's called oblique motion. So this is called parallel motion, where um, both voices are moving in the same rhythm in the same direction. If one voice is moving while another one sustains, it's called oblique motion. Now, in this case, that top voice isn't moving per se. It's staying on the same pitch, but at least rhythmically it's moving. So I'll, I'll call it honorary oblique motion. So anyhow, Jim is using that. He's using parallel motion. And then it's all parallel, and now it starts being, you know, different things between the voices, but only one at a time, right? It's one, it's just the 16th notes in the left hand, followed by just the 16th notes in the right hand. Only when he gets here does he actually have a sustained note while uh, the other voice is moving. But again, it's very much in keeping with that idea of one sustaining note while another one moves, which still has that certain level of sim simplicity. When both voices are moving, but in different rhythms, well, now is when you have more complexity, and he's going to get to that. So, and also check the interval here, third. It ends with a sixth, a third here, and a sixth there. So yes, there's other intervals in those 32nd notes, but those are moving lines. And so they create dissonances and resolve, and resolve them simultaneously. So, so far in the piece, I thought, okay, there's just an introduction and it's all pretty diatonic and simple, but then, uh, and it remains so here, up until that point, it's all basically simple triad. But once he starts getting here, ah, bum, 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 bum. <clears throat> so check out what happens there. What's that? <clears throat> mm -mm -mm. It's not a Christmas song, right? That Mary had a little lamb. Um, but it's displaced because Mary had a little lamb would normally be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, as far as the uh, timing goes. But he has it as one, 
four. Um, so it's like displaced by a B, which already makes it harder to recognize. Yeah, and see, Joanne, I was going to say Jingle Bells too, but it's not Jingle Bells. It's Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary Had a, is right. Jing, jingle Bells, Jingle Bells. But yeah, so it's if we just hear j those three notes, we could say Jingle Bells. Sure, because those three notes are also um, Mary, Little Lamb or Jingle Bells are the same. But what's happening underneath it is a dissonant chord consonant and then dissonant and then more dissonance dissonant chord resolving to more dissonance so this is the point at which he's making it pretty clear to me that he has no intention of doing expected things harmonically despite using expected elements like those parallel sixths and parallel thirds he's using the expected elements he's playing a c major scale that's just a C major scale. So he's using expected elements, but then introducing this bit of what's called rhythmic displacement, taking Mary had a little lamb, but putting it on beat two. One, two, three, four, one. Mary had a little lamb. Right? It's a, it makes it, it's called rhythmic displacement when you do that. At least that's one of the terms that could be used for it. So, yeah, and then at that point, things just get crazier and crazier because so far it's all diatonic. Now, okay, yeah, at that point, he is, um, the joke is is uh, now out of the bag as it is. It's like, okay, no semblance of this being what we originally thought it was going to be. And I frankly completely was fooled by this piece until that measure. I still thought even through that dissonance of the... I still was, you know, that was little bits of dissonances there. I was like, oh, Jim did some weird stuff in there, but 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 he'll clean it up later. But no, he just pushes it that much further, and he does this little business down here. Um, so this this measure right here, what that that sound there, right? And especially in this synth sound that he's got going. It was just a, you know, basically a burp. And on piano or digital piano, as this is, it's a little more definition, but the electric piano sample that it was using had that much less definition on that. This is not uh, something you would normally um, choose to write. And I've often made the observation before about what I call C level and that middle C, has a certain relationship when we're trying to play chords. We like to keep most of our chords kind of centered around middle C. The C below that, C3, is sort of almost like the ocean floor. Now, it's not quite the ocean floor, but it, whatever. It's a, it's a different form of C level. And my rule about this C is don't give me two different pitches below that C. And you, you can get away with it sometimes. And we talked about opening of uh, Sonata Pathétique and, and other situations where Beethoven is going for this heavy sound and putting a whole chord below middle C. But in general, unless you want that level of heaviness or darkness, you don't put multiple notes. You can put notes an octave apart as low as you want. You can play perfect fifths pretty low and get away with it. But a whole triad or even thirds, intervals that should be consonant, um, are, are much more dissonant, one, much more dissonant once we get below this C level. So I usually talk about only using perfect fifths or octaves below here. And so Jim is like, yeah, yeah, I'm giving you this big heavy chord down here because I can. And then it goes into this whole crazy bit of, of, of dissonance and uh, chromaticism in there, at which point we've lost all semblance of thinking it's going to suddenly turn into a, a happy Christmas medley right and we know it's it's going to just be um it's going to be the tongue-in-cheek musical uh bit of humor that it's meant to be and yeah i'm quite sure that jim is not lying that in there are probably snippets of other christmas songs like what's going on here huh yeah 
still can't uh, quite place exactly what's what he's hinting at there. But my guess is he's hinting at, at something. What if I look at the top voice, the top note of these chord voices? Bum, 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 ba, da, da. Nah, okay, that's nothing. I was wondering if the top note of each of those chord voices in the left hand would add up to some melody. What about the bottom notes? Um, so anyhow, these are the elements that Jim plays with. And when he's giving us the expected things like those nice parallel six and parallel thirds and major scales, um, you know, we're like, oh yeah, that's all good. When he starts using dissonance that doesn't resolve, then we're like, what is going on here? And then when he starts using additional dissonance that doesn't resolve and involves all that chromaticism, you know, it has a different emotional effect. That's the point where I broke out like audibly laughing. There's also this aspect of, I'm not playing the chords right, but playing entire chords like that, moving like that, that's not playable on piano. You, I mean, I shouldn't say not playable, but it's like really awkward to play moving chord. Now, if it's three different instruments you're writing for, you know, a, a flute, of you know, a, a flute, a clarinet, and an oboe or something, then yeah, you can play 16th notes and form chords like that. But it's going to sound... A little heavier than you think it's going to. That, that'll be my observation about that. Um, if you, uh, there's a particular sound, and it's a sound, and I, I will now hearken back to uh, Flight to Nassau that I talked about in the uh, our, you know, the thing I put in the newsletter there, that the, the Count Basie, Sam Unesco piece. There's a technique that's called a saxophone soli, where we have a chord voicing in. In, in usually in five saxophones, so this is only four, so I, I can't I can't improvise these in four voices uh, as as fast as I can in five. Uh, um, so there's a whole technique for how you voice. <coughs> Set, like five saxophones, two altos, two tenors, and a baritone sax, typically, and you voice them so that they can play melodies in what are in what's called a drop two substitute double lead is the technical term for it. Um, and at some point, I'll do a, a a whole session, you know, on on that. We can take a month to look at uh, writing saxophone solos. But the idea is, you might write a melody like I'm. I could write "Mary Had a Little Lamb" that way. In saxophone solis, though, we typically don't do them in quarter notes. We pick eighth note melodies. And so it might be more like... Uh, you know, that's a pretty really um, diatonic version. That was all just G major. But what Jim is doing here with all these passing diminished chords... Right? If you look at what's going on in the left hand, that's a diminished chord. And then another diminished chord, another diminished chord. So alternating regular chords, major and minor chords, with diminished chords, and then back to a major or minor chord. And by the way, I say major or minor because what is this chord? Is this major or minor? This is a trick question. That chord, we could say, hey, this is an A minor 7. It's an A minor seventh chord rearranged. Yeah, but it could be a C6, right? It could be a C major chord with an added sixth. In the sort of jazz world that uh, Jim comes from uh, as well, I mean, he, come, he also, you know, dealt, deals with concert band music a lot, but he comes from playing in a, you know, basically a, a, a old, you know, New Orleans slash Chicago Dixieland style band that uh, he works in. And that that world uh, uses this sound of sixth chords a lot. And in jazz, we use that a lot, especially when it comes to these um, moving lines that I talked about. And so Jim is, is playing another little, you know, musical joke or musical inside reference here to the sound of a saxophone solely by referencing those sounds here in his chord voicings and doing this 
16th note craziness version on top of it, which you wouldn't normally do. The, the eighth notes is as far as you do. There's a couple passages. There's one famous passage in a, like a, um, what is it? Uh, the, the, um, basically blues, is it? There's a couple, there's like an arrangement for Buddy Rich Band that has some crazy 16th note passage arranged as a solely like that. That's like an important part of the repertoire. I think it's basically blues, but I always forget. Um, and then this. Oh, I got the wrong key. That repeating the chord is like, yeah, that's not even going to fly with horns. This, you could write 16th notes or whatever the notes are. You could totally write those in 16th notes for three different horns, and it's going to sound a little funny, but it'll be playable. But this is going to be that much harder to play now because if you want to play um, 16th note lines on a wind instrument, we need to slur them. Um, meaning, right? I can do that really easy, just moving my fingers up and down and one steady stream of air. But to repeat the note, I have to ta 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 ta. I have to da da da. I have to use my tongue, and and suddenly it becomes like walking in big heavy cement boots or something, um, and it becomes like it it becomes this whole other feel. This so repeating notes quickly on wind instruments is not. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it totally changes the feel from what would have been achievable in scalar lines like that. Um, and so, when you want that sound, you go for it. Now, strings can just vibrate the bo the bow, and that um, works maybe a little better. It's uh, it's a little more. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Idiomatic for strings to have that kind of passage. Um, but in any case, you know, I don't know if he literally intends this to be played on electric keyboard, if he literally intends it to be played at all, because, you know, I think he's just having fun here. Um, but yeah, so wow, there was so much to talk about on this, despite it being just a bit of musical silliness. And so, um, yeah, I... Uh, uh, <laughs> had to work on that to get just the right amount of quirkiness. Um, that one little lick is uh, the point of the whole piece, measure 25. So is he talking about, oh, this lick here. <laughs> okay, obviously he's kidding that that's it. He's just really having fun with us um, because that's just, uh, that's like just wiggling your fingers faster over the keys because I don't think there really is anything more to that. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's a diminished triad. And then it's a little, um, that's a little bit of E minor there. But yeah, I, I, I think he's not really going to that level of, of thought about exactly what's going on. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a, a fun little journey. And it's completely now, everything I've done so far today has very nicely taken my mind off of all the other craziness that I'm dealing with today. So I think on that note, I'm going to just say, you know what, we've talked about music. We've looked at a lot of different things, even though we basically only looked at one of my pieces in one of Jim's, but, uh, but yeah, we got to talk about a lot of aspects of creating music. So I'm, um, I'm happy with it. So here we go to finish this, finish the uh, morning or afternoon or evening, whatever you all, whatever time it is for you out. Uh, this has been the music masterclass and uh, yeah, every week it's a little something different. Um, we might try some ear training exercise next week. I don't know. We'll try some different things. If people have other music they want us to be looking at, we can be looking at that. Starting when I do the harmony course, we're going to be really focused. And so I'm, you know, just trying to look, have some fun this month because starting either probably sometime next month, we will begin in earnest working on the harmony course and working through all the lessons. And I really look forward to having uh, people come along on that journey. And I've got really specific exercises we work on, reharmonizations, and we're, which we deal with all that stuff. So that's what you have to look forward to coming up. And I uh, hope you all enjoyed today's session uh, as much as I did. And I will see you all next time. Goodbye.